principle selection, what we're usually talking about is finding the right hyperparameters. Does that make sense? OK. It's a great question. If anybody's unclear on a concept like that, this is a very important thing to clear up. Yeah? For the support vector machines, are you trying to minimize the mis misclassification error or the hinge error? The hinge error. The support vector machine. Do, do, do. Let's go back over here. Where are we at? Okay, so this is a good enough slide. So in the support vector machine, what we're minimizing is two terms. This term is the hinge error. This term is, of course, the size of the weights, which we are simultaneously trying to minimize both of these. And that's our loss function. Sound good? OK, so no, too slow. OK. So a uh, couple of things, or we're, we're past time. Yeah, we're starting now. OK, so uh, we left you off. I asked you the question, what's the difference between logistic regression and support vector machines? And the answer, because I pressed the key one space too far, so you've all seen it already, is that they have different loss functions they're optimizing, so they are different at training time, right? But at test time, predicting, they're both just f of x is equal to w x plus b, right? They're both just linear algebra at decision time, OK? So logistic regression is optimizing the log loss. And support vector machines are optimizing the hinge loss plus the size of the weight vector. But they're both positive class if you are wx plus b greater than 0, right? This is a more obtuse way to say that, but fundamentally it's the same thing. When wx plus b is greater than 0, the logistic function of wx plus b is greater than 0.5. So they're the exact same thing. It's just that this one's couched in terms of probabilities because it's explicitly operating on probabilities. This one's not operating on probabilities. So, but. Fundamentally, these criteria right here, they are the same. Make sense? You'll see this again and again. Any kind of linear algorithm that is linear in the weights looks like this at test time, but it has radically different training. That's why they're different algorithms. OK. So by the way, um, before I go further on that, because I kind of lost my mojo with the early questions, I did want to say something about logistics, OK? Two things. One, the current assignment, there's been some confusion about the due date. I said Saturday. The TA said Friday. Because of that confusion, I just want to make it Saturday to give those people who are depending upon the extra day the extra day. So we have caught that error that there was a conflict. And it is now Saturday for sure. And hopefully the TA has posted on Campus Wire to this effect. OK? It still says Friday on Campus Wire? On Gradescope. On Gradescope. Uh, that will be changed. Uh, as soon as I get a chance to. <laughs> OK, the other logistics thing that I wanted to mention, yes, exams are almost finished grading. There's just some hand grading left to do. Uh, I was hoping to get it out today, but I'm pretty sure it's not going to happen. 
So it's going to be Saturday-ish, right? They've told me they will get the hand grading done early Saturday. I'll get a chance to look it over, and I'll release the grades. OK? Any other logistics issues anybody wants to bring up? OK. Then let's continue on with SVMs. So just to put this all into perspective, we have the idea that if we're doing classification, the natural element of classification is, did I make an error? Is one loss. Did I not make an error? Zero loss. The standard zero one loss or misclassification error. Now, we know that this is a pain in the ass. We know that there's the zero gradient and infinite gradient problem. We know that the half hard loss is a kind of version of this, right? It is related to the, um, the hard loss, to the, the zero one loss. But it has a gradient, right? It has a gradient everywhere. It got a gradient here. It's a constant slope, which happens to be yx. And it's got a zero slope there. So because it's got a gradient, we can do gradient descent. And to boot, the Lagrangian dual formulation also has a gradient everywhere because the Lagrangian, the dual formulation that we talked about last time, it's an equivalent problem. So it solves the same way. OK. So, right. And if you think about the logistic loss, the logistic loss also is a gradiented version of the 0, 1 loss, right? So these stupid slide animations get in my way. I should deal with them someday. But this one clearly has slopes everywhere, right? There's no place where it goes 0 or infinite. So it's a nice, soft loss. And it's very good at gradient descent. OK. So um, why do I have another version of this? I don't know. All right. So to recap, support vector machines. We've got a gradient descent learning where at test time, we're just yet another linear classifier. The particular thing we're going to gradient descent is going to be the hinge loss plus the regularization term, or the margin expander term, however you want to think about it. We know that. Let's, let's stop for a second. You know what I never diagrammed out? Hinge loss. We've already said that's very clearly convex. What about that term? Which is equal to Is that convex? Nobody wants to stick their neck out. Yeah. Yeah, so, so if it was L1, it would be an absolute value one. This is an L2, right? And the clue is right here. That's a squared term, right? So it's a parabola, and it is indeed absolutely convex. So the loss function has got two terms. It's got the hinge loss plus this term. So a convex function plus a convex function is a yeah. So I just kind of shortcut all that, because I, it's obvious in my head, but it just occurred to me I should point out to you that both terms of support vector machine are convex, and therefore the loss function is convex. 
All right. So that is support vector machines. Now, let's make it more complicated. So support vector machines are linear in the weights. We've seen how linear in the weights, like with ordinary least squares, doesn't mean that the function we're fitting is a linear function, right? Remember polynomial regression? All we got to do is manipulate the x's and make one column x and the next column x squared and the column after that x cubed. And even though we're linear with the weights, by making nonlinear transformations of the data, we can fit nonlinear things, right? That's polynomial regression. Support vector machines have the same trick. So if we make a nonlinear transformation of the input space and run it through a linear support vector machine, we get a nonlinear decision boundary. Instead of drawing a line on things, we can draw any old curve you want to separate positive class from negative class. All right, are you ready? This is such a trick, it's actually called a trick. It's called the kernel trick. It was like published in a paper, said the title was the kernel trick. Okay, here's the kernel trick. We have a transformation of the original inputs. So if we're just talking about, you know, two-dimensional inputs, the x vector is one comma one. That's its x, y location, okay? So this is some test point. Some, something we want to see, what class is it? These are three, I've called them landmarks. You might call them support vectors. Right? What are support vectors? They're training set data that determines where the boundary is. Right? We know that data points that are far, far away from the decision boundary, they're not going to be support vectors. Only data points close to where the decision boundary lands are support vectors, right? So these are just some positive class and negative class instances that happen to determine where the decision boundary is because in the dual formulation, their alphas are non-zero. That's why they're support vectors, right? Okay. So instead of representing my data as, here's my training point again, as its x vector, one comma one, what I can do is I can calculate a similarity score. I can say, how similar is this vector to this support vector? How similar am I to this support vector? How similar am I to this one? This quote-unquote similarity score can be as simple as Euclidean distance, right? That's a natural similarity score between vectors. It could be more obtuse, like a radial basis function. What if we put Gaussians at every one of these support vectors. And instead of the Euclidean distance between a support vector and the data point x, we put that Gaussian right there. We know it's standard deviation, right? So we can say in the Gaussian PDF, right, how many standard deviations down am I at this point? And so we replace x's one comma one with the Gaussian PDF as if it, the mean is right here at the support vector. What would the value be over here? And then over here we have, again, how many standard deviations down would I be to support vector two? And how many standard deviations down would I be to support vector three? 
So my, what had been a two-dimensional input, right? One comma one, that's the location in the Euclidean space, has now become three similarity scores. The similarity to the first support vector, the similarity to the second support vector, and the similarity to the third support vector. Is this making sense? Again, this could be as simple as a Euclidean distance, but there's a reason I'm setting up the Gaussian case, because that is something known as the radial basis <coughs> kernel. Okay? And it is a very common kernel for support vector machines. Now, again, this is the same trick as in polynomial regression. We're taking linear inputs, making a nonlinear transformation, feeding the nonlinear features through a linear algorithm and getting out a nonlinear boundary because of that. Everybody tracking the concept? Questions? None. Either complete blankness or I'm perfect at this. Okay, what happens if the standard deviation is very different, right? If the standard deviation is a big number, then our similarity scores are big numbers. If our standard deviations are tiny, then our similarity scores are tiny numbers. Okay? So this standard deviation is a hyperparameter of a radial basis function. And big standard deviations lead to lots of smoothing and very smooth decision boundaries. Rather like, because you might be thinking of this a little bit like a k-nearest neighbor situation, like high k, like lots of neighbors computing. Okay. A small standard deviation means only the very, very closest support vectors can really meaningful, meaningfully contribute to the description of this vector, right? This one's way too far away, e to the minus four. I mean, this one here is e to the minus two, so that's not so hot, but this is a real steep drop off, okay? So things that are far away with small standard deviation, support vectors that are far compared to that standard deviation, they're just not going to contribute much. So effectively, we've reduced the number of neighbors we're computing. We're down to really only two neighbors contributing. This one is contributing such a tiny amount, it doesn't matter. So this is a three nearest neighbor kind of setup, and this one is a two nearest neighbor kind of setup. So we have, just like with nearest neighbors, when we have big standard deviations, we're smoothing over a lot of information and we get smooth decision boundaries. And when we have tiny standard deviations, we have relatively few neighbors contributing and we get much jaggeder, more data-dependent boundaries. This is not regularized. This is regularized. Yeah. Exactly. It's a, think of it like a smoothness term rather than a standard deviation. How much smoothing do we want to do? Yep, you're right. It's not a statistical standard deviation fit on an empirical data set. Okay? So we've made a nonlinear transformation. That nonlinear transformation has a hyperparameter. Okay. Um, but again, like, this is still just a linear algorithm. At test time, what we do is we predict one when the weights times these similarity scores is greater than zero. So for the set of weights that I just kind of constructed here, 
then we're going to get a particular answer about what class this is. OK? And if we pick a different set of hyperparameters, then we're going to potentially get a different answer at this point. Because again, we've gone from th effectively three nearest neighbors, roughly speaking here, down to two nearest neighbors with the same weights. So we're possibly going to make a different decision. OK. So this explicitly introducing nonlinearity into the features, again, like you kind of already saw it from the idea of polynomial regression. But I want to throw one more curve into your understanding here. So if you look back at the similarity score, look, right? This is a two-dimensional data space. The original data space is two-dimensional. This is a three-dimensional feature space. Part of the kernel trick is expanding the feature space. Going into a higher dimensionality is part of the trick. So let's look at how that could work. So in a, something like this, it, we could not draw a line through this and accurately separate all the test, uh, so all the training set because you, the real separator is quadratic, right? You can't draw a quadratic with a line. I think that's pretty obvious. So this is the same thing, but I've mirrored it, right? We have the donut. We have the true separator, if this was half of it, was, would be a quadratic, OK? But in mirrored set, we've got to make a circle. And defining that is requires giving it a polynomial solution that could construct a circle. For instance, this one, where we take x1 and x2, and we expand it into three dimensions, where we have x1, x2, and x1 times x2 plus x1 x1 squared times x2 squared. This kind of a polynomial enables you to construct a circle, right? Squareds plus the thing plus a constant, you can turn that into a circle. OK, but an alternative view of that same phenomena is what if I project up into a third dimension? For instance, if I project up like this, that's the third dimension. In constructing the right third dimension, what I have done is I have raised up things that are out here. This stuff is now higher, and this stuff is now lower. That's what we're seeing here on this projection. The center is low in that third dimension, and the exterior of the circle is high. That's what this polynomial does. Guess what I can do now? I can make a linear separation. The third dimension is constructed so that I can slice across it and make a linear separation of what had previously been a nonlinear problem. Okay? It's an alternate viewpoint on the same phenomena. Expanding dimensionality, when done in the right way, lets you pull apart the problem into a linear separation. Does this make sense? OK, so let me be very clear to you. You can only construct things like this when you know what the data look like. Right? If you have an understanding of what the data you've been given, what kind of structure they have, and you can construct, for instance, 
This is called a polynomial kernel, right? We had a radial basis kernel a minute ago. This is a polynomial kernel where we created this new dimension that was a polynomial of the other dimensions, right? If you know the structure of your data, you can conceivably just analytically or intuitively even construct a third or a fourth or a fifth dimension, whatever you need, that separates out the problem. Okay? This is an analytic approach. Polynomial kernels work best when we have data that we can understand, really, such that we can construct a polynomial that separates. Okay, so um, what is a kernel? I've kind of avoided saying it so far, in part because I was supposed to release a pre-video yesterday, and I didn't because I had quite the day. Okay, so nobody ever saw my pre-video on kernels. So let me now take one moment to talk about what a kernel is. A kernel is a mathematical transformation where we can write it like this, right? The kernel of one data point with another data point. That's the, that's the nature of this beast. We can write it as a multiplication. Sorry, I didn't want to do that. Uh, give me this back. There we go. So we can write it as a multiplication. In the data space here, right? So we take the original data and we multiply it by itself at a constant, take it to the dth power. That is a polynomial kernel where d is the power we're going to here, okay? So anytime we can write a multiplication in linear algebra of two data points, some function like that, this is a kernel. When we can express it as a dot product of two things, that is another feature of a kernel. If we can express it as a dot product, it's a kernel. But really, okay, you just, you just have to think of it like the similarity operation that we talked about in the beginning. If we have two data points, like one of the positive class points here, that's a support vector maybe, and we have some test data point, X and green, and we just want to know, hey, how similar are those two? Either in polynomial space, or in radial basis space, or however we want to do that. Okay? Now the really cool thing about kernels is that we never have to calculate them in their original basis. We don't calculate in X. We calculate in the transform data space. Even better, because we can turn any kernel into a dot product situation, what we often do is we just end up getting a scalar number, right? We can just work with scalars where we dot product together the two data points, the support vector and our test data point in the transform data space and the result is, of course, a scalar because it's a dot product. So now we're working with just a bunch of scalars. Okay? So the decision boundary is not in the original data space. It's not in the transform data space. It's in this dot product data space, which makes it much more efficient. Okay. So, let's get ourselves a kind of um, physical intuition on a kernel, because I gave you a mathematical definition. Can we write it as, you know, a bunch of linear algebra? Can we write that linear algebra as some dot products? Then it's a kernel, 
That's a very abstract mathematical definition that probably doesn't have much traction in your mind. Okay? But you've maybe, maybe you've done image processing in one way or another. You ever put on a sharpen filter or a blur filter on a photo in your Apple Photos or whatever you use, right? How does that work? Do you ever think about that? The way it does it is it takes windows, just like this little image behind me, and it puts a function on top of a pixel in your image. So if you have an image right here, and this is a pixel I want to operate on, I put my filter right here, and I take a group of, say, you know, nine pixels, three by three around it. And if I'm going to make a blur, like, you know, like when you have the portrait mode on your phone and it blurs out everything in the background. Okay? If I'm going to make a blur, I just take the average of all of those nine, the surrounding pixels, and I replace the center pixel with that average. And that's a blur operation. And then I shift over a pixel and I do it again. A window of nine, and I shift over and I do it again. Maybe you've even encountered in one of your math classes the word convolution. That's what this is. The dot product operation is a convolution. Okay? So a kernel is just anything that can be turned from an operation in a different data space into a convolution or a dot product. Okay? And it's just applied in a moving window across the entire data space. Okay, so this is what a kernel is. You've got a physical intuition, you've got a mathematical definition. I'm going to add one more thing to your idea. If you know something is a kernel, like a polynomial is a kernel, or a radial basis is a kernel, it turns out if you make a function of kernels, that is also a kernel. So you can add together a radial basis plus polynomial, and that's a kernel. OK? So very typically, you're using scikit-learn. You're just going to tell scikit-learn, hey, I want to support vector machine. I want a radial basis, or I want a polynomial of degree d. And that's probably the way you're going to use it, probably. But I want you to know that in the future, should you need to do something super custom, should you look at a data set and say, shit, if I took a Gaussian plus a polynomial plus something else, I could make a clean separating hyperplane in a 15th dimension. Okay? And should you be in that situation, I just want you to know that you can construct custom kernels to fit your needs. Okay. I don't expect you to necessarily do that, certainly not in this class, but I want you to understand that you can. Okay. So uh, besides the things we've discussed, one other kernel that will come up is a sigmoid or a tan H. Right? It's a nonlinearity that is also a kernel. If you don't know, it also looks a lot like a logistic function. That's what those guys are. OK, any questions so far? Wow, I must be doing perfect. <laughs> or this is just mind boggling, which is more likely. <laughs> OK, so the dual formulation, right? And the kernel together. This is the most powerful version of a support vector machine. What you're doing is you're saying, hey, I have my support vectors, and I want to know what is the class of this guy. OK? Well, if I'm using, say, Gaussian similarity, then I just make all these measurements, right? These are all just. Gaussians, I sum them up, right? And of course, there's other data points out here, but they're not support vectors. Their alphas are zero, 
so they just don't contribute to this measurement. And again, these X's, these X's are kernel transformations, right? This is the dot product of the Gaussian of the support vector and my current data point. That's what that X is. It's the dot product of the kernel itself, OK? So again, the weight vector is completely defined by the non-zero alphas, the support vectors, right? And when we take this inner product, right, we're doing the math in 1D space. We're doing that convolution. We're getting the dot product answers. And we're just summing up the dot product answers over the kernels. So that's it, really. Um, the, you, know, you can do this in examples. You can take the polynomial kernel. We can take a data set that's got x1 and x2. And then we can take higher order polynomials of that, right? And that's just doing this to the original data to create a, in this case, quadratic on the original data space. Okay. So this kernel trick saves time and space by computing the value in the, um, you don't have to make the feature transformation explicitly. We just take the dot product. Okay. So we could, instead of having to actually construct that third dimension and lift stuff up, we just do those dot products. Okay, that means that we do, depending upon how many support vectors we got, that's the dimensionality of our feature space, right? So if you have a lot of support vectors, it could still be relatively computationally intense. But that's better than scaling with the number of dimensions in the raw data set, potentially. If the number of dimensions in the raw data set is much bigger, than the number of support vectors you've got, which is certainly possible, right? Like genomic data sets, thousands of variables, because you have 27,000 protein coding genes in a human being, right? So you have thousands of variables. You can do support vector machines. You're probably not going to have thousands of support vectors. So you're going to scale with the number of support vectors in your computation. So that's good. All right. So seriously, nobody has any questions on kernels? Yeah. Yeah, so um, that's getting into the mechanics of the support vector machine solver. And I haven't really talked about that. And to be brutally honest, I don't think I know it off the top of my head. So uh, the support vector machine solver, there's a couple of default pieces of software that people use. And I guarantee, I'm pretty sure, I shouldn't say I guarantee, I'm pretty sure that they do do some things like chopping off low alphas in there. But I, I haven't looked at that for like a decade and a half. So I don't really know off the top of my head. But it's a good question and a good intuition that I think is probably right, that they probably do chop off alphas. Yeah? Does the runtime of the support vector machine look similar to the Yeah, so high, as dimensionality scales, Right, you're screwed. But 
if your support vector dimensionality is the thing that's determining it after you do the kernel trick, right? You take your original data space, you do the dot product, the convolution on it, and you get out a set of feature vectors that are dimensionality and the number of support vectors, right? Um, obviously, at training time, you know, you're iterating and you're going to have different, you know, if you're doing gradient descent, you know, you're going to have different numbers of support vectors. But overall, there's probably, again, I wish, I should probably look this up again. There's probably, at each step, some sort of limiting factor on how many support vectors get considered. So, you know, it's a possibly constant. I don't know. I shouldn't speculate. Uh, but yeah, you know, something like that that keeps the dimensionality pretty low. So support vectors are not terrible at high dimensionality, OK? Um, all right. We do have a notebook on these guys. Uh, looks like I don't have loads of time for the notebook. But just to point out that if you go to the notebook repo, um, let's make this bigger so people can see this. Okay. You should definitely play with this on your own. As usual, you're going to get so much more out of playing with this notebook than listening to me, blah, blah. But I want to point out some things. OK, first off, uh, man, maybe I zoomed in too much. OK. So let's make an easy data set to start with, a data set we can easily put a line in. OK? So, uh, you know, we had this whole thing. What we want to do is we want to put in the margins, right? Maximizing the margin. And there's only one of those potential decision boundaries that has a really big margin. So everybody understands this. Here's how it works in scikit-learn land. From scikit-learn.svm, we can import support vector classifier. Okay, it's the usual thing. In scikit, everything's an object. Every model, every estimator is an object. So you need to get an instantiation of that object. And when we give it constructor arguments, this is what we started off with, just making a line. Okay, linear support vector machine, no kernel. This is, remember, C is a number that goes back and forth. And when C is, what happens when C is small? What happens when C is big? Does anybody remember? C is a term that's on the hinge loss. So a big number makes the hinge loss more important and the regularizer or margin maximizer less important. A small c makes the, mac the margin more important. So big c's are hard classifiers. Small c's are soft. OK. So we fit the data. We can see after it's fit that we can see all the elements of the thing, including these coefficients. These coefficients are the W vectors, OK? I got a handy dandy little helper function here that will just plot the resulting decision boundary and which vectors are support vectors after training, OK? This only works in two dimensions, sadly. I wish that this, this function would work in higher dimensionality, but there you go, it's just for toy problems. So if you want to see that list of support vectors, that's here after the model has been fit. It's a, um, I'm stuck in C land. It's not called a field. What's it called in Python? Somebody help me. An attribute, God. Man, why I got stuck in C, I don't know, okay. All right, so we can do more, right? We can see that if we start mutating our training data set, 
we can see that this support vector's approach is pretty robust. So the entire data set is 120. And if we just take a random 60, we get pretty much the same answer. Because by taking half, we only have a half chance of hitting three support vectors and taking one of them out. And so we didn't get it, right? Whereas we went down to a quarter of the original data, we lost a couple of the original support vectors. And so our answer changed. Okay, so it's pretty robust to changes in the data. All right, so if we want to do something that requires a nonlinear decision boundary, right? We can see that fitting a line in this is not going to do a good job, right? That's pretty obvious, <laughs> okay? So let's not do that. Let's use a polynomial. This is an x squared term. We know that the x squared works on the donut data set because we were just talking about it in the slides, right? The x squared, the parabola, goes up to the edges. So if you convolve a parabola with a donut data set, the edges of the donut go up, and the center of the donut stays down, right? So we can just define a new data set, then this is, again, this is the explicit transformation into a third dimension, which you do not need to do, okay? I'm showing you the manual transformation from low D into the higher dimensionality, right? I've physically constructed phi here, and now when we, oh, why you no know work? Oh, because I didn't actually hit this. That's why. Okay. There we go. So we have, I guess I just did it inverse. Fine. Doesn't matter. Either way works. You can see that we've successfully, by making this third dimension, separated the data. And so we, can, we could fit a line to, I could fit a linear SVM to x plus adding phi as a new column to the data, and it would work just fine, right? A linear support vector machine will solve this. But I don't have to make this manual manipulation of my x's. I don't have to construct a new polynomial transform data set. All I have to do is tell my support vector classifier that I want a different kernel. Could be RBF, could be polynomial. Any of these would work. Is it poly or polynomial? Crap. Can't remember. Go to the scikit docs. Oh, it's poly. Okay. So let's take a look at the scikit docs for a second while we're here. As always, this should be the first thing you look at. So there are hyperparameters here. And those hyperparameters, they are dependent on your kernel. Degree is for polynomials says what degree the polynomial is going to be. Pretty obvious. If you set degree when you're doing an RBF kernel, it has zero effect, right? Degree is a polynomial hyperparameter. Gamma is what I was calling uh, standard deviation during my slides. Gamma is the scaling factor for the radial basis function. And it does work for radial basis function, but it also works for polynomial. What? What is it for polynomial? 
Hmm, and it doesn't say right there, actually. All right, so we gotta do some diving in to find out what gamma does in polynomial. I can't remember off the top of my head, that surprised me, so we should definitely figure that out. But in the meantime, we're out of time. You should go back and look at this more. Definitely look through that, um, I already lost it. This guy. Uh, you can see and play with soft margins versus hard margins for inseparable data. I also want to call out one other thing. Pipelines, preprocessors, and model selection grid search are all demoed for you right here, okay? We didn't really go through the model selection notebook in class at all, okay? But you should do that on your own. And here I have put together all of the things we have learned so far, scikit-learn pipelines to transform data, right? a grid search with different kinds of hyperparameters looking at different kinds of kernels simultaneously, okay? Because the different kernels have different arguments, different hyperparameters, okay? We'll still chat about this next week, but I want you to look at this yourself, okay? Have fun, everybody. Have a good weekend. Do something fun. <laughs>